Chapter 1. The 80-20 Principle was discovered by Vilfredo Pareto and other researchers. There are only a few theories that cut across all segments of society, and the 80-20 Principle happens to be one of them. It's commonly called the Pareto Principle, named after Vilfredo Pareto, who was the first to discover it. As an economist, Pareto's career involved studying the economics of nations and how resources were distributed among people. It was while doing this that he discovered a repeating pattern. He found that the wealth of every nation was controlled by just a few minorities. This discovery led him to further study the concept, and he realized how consistent the principle was. Of course, Pareto did his best, but he didn't fully understand it himself. Other people after him chanced upon the principle in their study, most of them without even consulting Pareto's materials. The works of these economists and researchers have helped develop the principle to what it is today. Individuals that understand the 80-20 concept have been using it to maximize personal and corporate productivity ever since. It's your turn to do so now. Before we proceed, what exactly is the 80-20 principle? In simplified form, the principle holds that a minority of causes, inputs, or efforts are responsible for the majority of the results. In other words, only a few things are responsible for the vast results we see around us. Just as only a few people control the majority of the world's wealth, and only a few students come out top in their class. If you take time to observe, you'll see the Pareto Principle at work all through life. There is an imbalance in life. Causes and effects are not always, if ever, in the 50-50 ratio. The 80-20 Principle doesn't necessarily connote that 80% of results come from exactly 20% of actions. The percentages are not always consistent. What's consistent is that few actions are really important in the whole scheme of things. Understanding this will help you prioritize the things that matter. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Richard Koch Imagine only 20% of a company's customers account for 80% of the sales. What will the company do to make more sales? A reasonable approach is to find creative ways to satisfy the 20% that matter. They could also come up with new strategies to market the bottom 80%. But they won't know all these if they don't take time to see how the 80-20 phenomenon applies to their organization. For the rest of this summary, you'll be learning how the 80-20 principle can help you in the corporate world as well as in your personal life. Let's get started. Did you know the Pareto principle was first introduced by Vilfredo Pareto in 1906? Chapter 2. The 80-20 principle can boost business profitability. Every business venture is out to maximize profit. It's sad that at one point or another, most businesses will experience setbacks that could have been avoided if the decision makers knew better. What if the 80-20 principle can help you pinpoint potential loopholes in your business? Many organizations across the globe use the 80-20 principle in their business activities to make the most of available resources. You too can apply the principle to your business. It's not difficult, but a bit analytical. Here's a simplified way to go about it. Take out time, or hire an analyst if you can, to study the following three components of your business. Your products, your customers, and your market position. How many products or product lines do you produce in a month, in six months, or a year? Choose the most reliable stats. And what are the sales and profit for these products? You will understand what customers patronize you the most and how often, as well as those that do not contribute significantly to your sales. You will most likely find an imbalance. Only a few percent of your total customers contribute to the bulk of your business profit. Go deeper to understand the reason for the trend. Is it that the top 20% customers have more capital than the others? Why do your products not appeal much to the bottom 80%? Is it a cost problem or something else? No, all these down. Your market share is determined by the number of people who love and consistently patronize your products. So the above analysis should reveal your position in the market. Now, what are creative ways to maximize your products, boost sales, and increase profits? One great way to do this is to focus on serving the top 20% and make efforts to reduce losses coming from the bottom 80%. It's also a great idea to study your competitors. Understand if you have the same product line as them and if their market is moving. Things that matter most must never be at the mercy of things that matter least. Richard Koch you may be producing the same products, but your competitors are more valuable in the eyes of the people. Understand why this is so, and what can you do to grab a better market share? Chapter 3. The 80-20 Principle Can Help You Multiply Sales 
There's a reason your customers or clients are patronizing you and not your competitors. If you find out why and make things work in their favor by pleasing them, your business will continue to enjoy growth. Your job after discovering this top 20% is to figure out a way to keep them glued to your business. You might want to expand your market share in the future. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that, but don't lose sight of your existing market. Knowing your top customers should also influence your marketing strategy and the quality of business decisions you make from time to time. Target your marketing at the top 20%, and you won't need to bother much about the marketing resources you put in because you know your efforts will surely pay off. Sales is like a twin brother of marketing. One can't function without the other. As such, make it a point to encourage peak performance among your sales force. Any business with a weak sales force will eventually crash, no matter how good its products or services are. You can also apply the 80-20 rule to your sales team. Research shows that less than 50% of the sales team in a company accounts for most of the sales. Identify this minority in your sales force and don't joke with them. You can even figure out what the most performing salespeople in your business have in common. Use this to set standards for the rest of the sales team. Perhaps it's a specific strategy they use that works so well. Or maybe they have soft skills like communication or persuasion. Could these skills be taught to the underperforming majority? If yes, you may need to hire an expert for sales training. But if that doesn't work, you could always ask the best performing salespeople on your team to help you hire folks like them. Don't be afraid to lay off underperforming workers. Business is business. Your goal is to maximize profit using elite resources, not keep paying people that can't produce the results you're paying them for. Don't be afraid to lay off underperforming workers. Chapter 4. The 80-20 Principle Can Help You Achieve More in Less Time To effectively maximize the 80-20 rule, you need to first understand that the imbalance in our world is real and natural. Next, you need to imbibe 80-20 thinking. We're talking about critical thinking that no one can do for you, especially because it applies to your personal life. No one knows your personal life as much as you do. You can't even explain it to a coach perfectly such that they know exactly what's going on with you. Hence, 80-20 thinking is a personal thing. It's not a difficult thing to do, though. Put simply, 80-20 thinking for effective time usage is all about brainstorming creative ways to leverage time. Approximately 80% of our results indeed come from the 20% of the time put in. Ask the most productive people and they'll tell you they aren't productive 24 hours a day. There are specific times when each of us is highly productive. If you don't know your most productive times yet, the simple exercise below will help you find it. Think about the last time you felt really productive. Go over at least two more productive days too. This is just so that the conclusion you arrive at can be certain to work predictably. After identifying at least three productive days in the past, the next step is to find why and when you were productive on those days. Did you work at night? In the early hours of the day? What happened the day before that could have contributed to your productivity? How did you handle distractions on those days? Document your thoughts. Use recurring points as pointers to your productivity. Reflect on your most productive days and figure out what you did differently. Then, do it again the next day. You can also use a similar exercise to improve your happiness level. Richard Koch recommends having two blank sheets of paper. Label them Happiness and Achievement Islands, respectively. On the first piece labeled Happiness Island, identify the things you did that made you happy on such happy occasions. Do the same for the Achievement Island. This may prove to be a mentally tasking activity, as you may have to do some deep thinking. But it's all okay, because you'll find gems that will become your secret productivity tools. A word of caution. As you carry out this exercise, try as much as possible to not put blame on others for making you unhappy or unproductive. Blaming people won't help you make progress. Chapter 5. When it comes to relationships, choose quality over quantity. We can't do without relationships. Life isn't meant to be lived in isolation, so we would always need people by our sides. It's pride to say you don't need anyone. Learn from nature. You were born into this world by your parents, you most likely have siblings, and you grew up having childhood friends even when you didn't know anything about life. That's proof that we need people. One important thing you should know about relationships is that they influence who you become. The common saying is true, you become like the people you hang around. If your friends are all millionaires, it will only take time before you become one. Similarly, if they're all broke, you'll end up like them if you don't do anything about it. Choose your relationships wisely. You can't choose your family members, but you have the power to choose every other person you hang around. 
It's in your power to choose your significant other, your best friends, your professional allies, neighbors, and so on. Make it count. You might be wondering how 80-20 applies to relationships. Here's how. Study upon study have shown that we have limited space for close relationships. You can be friends with as many people as you want, but you can only be close friends with very few people. These few people account for 20% or so of your overall relationships, but they make for more or less 80% of the value you get from relationships. For example, most people fall in love only once in a lifetime, have two childhood friends and two adult friends. The trend continues even in professional relationships. People may look up to tens of seniors, but only one to three will truly be their mentors. This is just how we're wired. Since we have limited capacities for close and meaningful relationships, wisdom demands that you don't rush to fill your spaces. Take time to vet people. Aside from choosing your significant other and best friends, Robert recommends developing six or seven professional relationships as follows. One or two relationships with mentors, people you look up to. Two or three relationships with peers you can trust. One or two relationships with mentees you'll pour your life into. For every relationship you form, there are five attributes that determine if the relationship will work or not. They include mutual enjoyment of each other's company, respect, shared experience, reciprocity, and trust. Chapter 6. Yes, you can live the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. For most people, certain lifestyles remain a dream that will never come true. The main reason for this is that the majority of such people have limited beliefs that keep them stuck in lifestyles they don't like. They hate their work. They don't like their relationships. Their bank account is nothing to write home about. But they can't seem to do anything to change their situation. Another set of people similar to these are those that don't even know what they want out of life. These people just go through the motions, taking whatever life throws at them. Don't feel bad if you belong to any of these categories. But understand that you can have the life you desire for yourself. To live the life of your dreams, you need to know exactly what it looks like. Pick a pen and paper, or use a digital notepad to write down all the things you want out of your life. Make the list as exhaustive as possible. Next, who do you know that is living such a life? What did they do to get there? And what are they doing that you're not? Success always has a blueprint. It's hard to speak on success and having it all without talking about careers. The reality is, most, if not all of us, will have to work. At least as adults. And it's not bad to work. What's bad is fitting square pegs in round holes. Many people are doing just that. You will find them in careers that don't suit their lives, and they won't leave. If you don't like your job, you can still be in it if it's the only thing paying the bills. But don't forget to have an escape plan. As an example, let's say you'd like to be an author, rather than work in your current accounting job. It's not reasonable to quit immediately. You could continue working with the accounting firm while building your writing career on the side. If you did this consistently and long enough, it will get to the point where the income from your writing side cake will suffice to take care of you. When this happens, save some more from your accounting job if you don't have anything saved for rainy days, then quit. Don't be stuck in a career you don't like without an escape plan. As important as work and career are, it's still important that you live a balanced life. You should be happy on all fronts. If you're not, it shows that something is missing and you may need to apply 80-20 thinking to bring balance to your life. If you're making progress at work but failing maritally, then you need to address that quickly. If it's your health that's suffering, pause and focus on it. The point is, don't live a lopsided life. Let each area of your life be healthy. That's how to truly be a happy person, and if it's possible for others, it's possible for you too. Conclusion the 80-20 principle advocates focusing on the top 20% that brings the most results, while neglecting or paying less attention to the bottom 80%. Doing this will not in any way cause the bottom 80% to be entirely neglected. The 80-20 principle is nature's way of balancing itself. What you neglect as the bottom 80% is the top 20% for other people. So, you neglecting it means allowing someone else to maximize their life and business. For example, if you're a business owner and you focus on investing more in the few workers that bring in the majority of the profits, you might eventually lay off some workers who aren't productive in your company. This isn't wrong. In fact, it will profit both of you. Because those laid off workers might later realize that they aren't made for the role they took in your company. In turn, this may lead them to self-discovery. Of course, this isn't always the case, but many great men and women would never have been great if someone didn't push them out of where they weren't meant to be. Try this. 
Apply 80-20 to time management. Take a piece of paper and pen down how your most productive days went. Note the things you did differently that helped you tick off your to-do list. Did you begin work earlier? Did you rest well the day before? What did you do about social media distraction? Note all the things you did differently. Use the list as your unique productivity and time management template.